So hello everyone and welcome to my Let's Talk series where I share conversations with those who support families navigate their international life successfully. Before we dive into today's topic, if you follow this live, please share your questions in the comments so that we can answer them. And if you watch the recordings, please leave your comments and questions in the comment section. We'll continue the conversation there. So I'm very, very happy to have Francis Diaz Evans as my guest today. Francis is a Latina educator, author, wife and mom to a teenager, <laughs> and she holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from Universidad del Este in Puerto Rico and a Master of Education in Spanish from the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina, where you live, right? Yes. <laughs> she is the founder and writer of the multicultural and bilingual parenting site, Discovering the World Through My Son's Eyes and Discovering Espanol, a business dedicated to mm -hmm. teaching Spanish online. Frances and I are also longtime members of the Multicultural Kid Blogs group on Facebook and uh, the website as well. As we both blog for multicultural and multilingual families since I, since 2012, and you, Francis? Yes. I think so, around the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we started on the, around the same time. So it's 10 years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but um, before we discuss today's topic, which is, I just re reminded, uh, how parents can help their teenagers in their language learning journey. Francis, please share a little bit more about yourself, your background, maybe also the languages that you speak and uh, everything you want to share. Okay. Well, I am... Um a Latina mama, and I'm also an educator. I teach Spanish online, but a little bit of story, a little backstory on my story or my son's bilingual journey. I started teaching him Spanish when he was four years old. Yeah, I know. A lot of people are like, oh, how's that possible? But you know, when you live in a monolingual environment, and unfortunately, I live in South Carolina, which is an English only state, meaning there aren't any bilingual programs, or if there are, they're in private schools. Well, anyways, um, and of course, you fall into the comfort of just speaking English, the community language with my husband, with the school, with the daycare. And lo and behold, he turns four years old. Um, his pediatrician, who knows that I'm bilingual, tells me, um, I bet, you know, he's bilingual by now. And I, that totally just blew my mind because I'm like, no. He is not, you know, um, he only knows those, um, the numbers and the colors because of Dora the Explorer. <laughs> and he was four years old. So I decided then that it was time to teach my son Spanish. So I literally turned my home into a Spanish language um, um, school. I'm gonna call it like that. Cause he was going to school, preschool in English. So whatever was taught to him in school, I was teaching to him in Spanish. But I didn't jump in like that directly all you know all in i did first the language boundary method like during bedtime bath time we play little games and i started introducing spanish obviously at four years old he's like mama what are you saying you know i'm like well this is the pato a duck you know yellow duck pato amarillo and we started like that and now i can probably say that i have a 13 year old bilingual son it wasn't easy, um, it wasn't impossible, it's hard, but you can do it. You know, anyone who wants to do it um, can do it as long as you, it's a lot of commitment on behalf of the parents. Yes, absolutely. Yes, it's a, it's a very, very important message that you're th sending there, Francis, that uh, we can introduce our heritage languages also later. Yes. Uh, if, if we do it consistently, right? So yes, that's, that's a the key. little bit. It's, it's a little bit the thing to, to remind everyone. I would like to, to thank Maria. Hi, Maria. She is another uh, member of the Multicultural Kid Blogs. <laughs> Hello Hi, from New York. <laughs> nice to see you too, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but Francis, let's, let's talk about how we can keep our teenagers. I also have three teenagers and I, I work with teenagers as well. Uh, how can we keep them somehow motivated to speak and then also 
talking about teenagers, they also read, right? So we're not talking about four-year-olds or six-year-olds that start maybe reading, but we are talking about children or young people <laughs> who are uh, reading. Hopefully they, they made it a habit, but uh, how can we keep them motivated to speak and then also read in the home or language or minoritized language or the heritage language, however we want to, to call it? Mm -hmm. Because, um, yes. I think with, with teenagers, um, we have to thread very carefully because their brain is developing. They have a lot of mood swings and a lot of changes. And it's something that they cannot help. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, the teenagers, they're rebels, they're this and that. But it's not that. It's something that really is affecting them in their brain. So with my teenager, he was a voracious reader. Reading in Spanish, he turned 11 12, 13, I think it started around 10 going on to 11, he would read less. So what I would suggest and what I've done is I think it was feeling, um, he was feeling very overwhelmed reading these big chapter books in Spanish. So what I did was buy him and get him comics or graphic novels in Spanish that he can read, you know, and I always say they're like little bite-sized little conversation that he can read. And it was something that he was interested in. At the beginning, it was, you know, like the Transformers. I know it is not um, authentic Spanish literature, but listen, I just needed my child to read in Spanish. So yeah. I got him these comics, um, Transformers, then I got him other graphic novels, and we kind of started building up. But of course, we need to listen, and I say listen in, in quotations, but not literally listen, but to listen to their body language. Most of the time, they're teenagers talk to us, talk to us with their body language. You know, we have to, you know, as parents, really, we have to decipher what they're saying, you know, how are they feeling? Because it is so hard. It is so hard. And not not push too much, you know, not put too much pressure. Because then we're going to go to the whole effective filter, but we'll talk about that a little later. But I think initially, it's just listening to our teenagers and mm -hmm. finding things that they're interested in. You know, my son is all into baseball now, so I look for books in Spanish, in the minority language, that are baseball related. Unfortunately, there aren't many, so I keep I have to keep scouring and looking, and I show him, I say, hey, what about this book? Nah, what about this one? Nah, he said, ah, maybe, you know, and I'm like, Phew. I say, okay, yes. let's, let's just give it, give it a day or two, and we'll try again. Yes, and he reads them in in, uh, in Spanish. In Spanish, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, maybe I can I can share. I prepared a few slides to to okay. just uh, illustrate a little bit what happens with children who are maybe not uh, who are not schooled in the school uh, in the home language. Mm -hmm. And um, let me just quickly share this one. So this is uh, something that actually happens very, very often in multilingual families or families who have another language at home than uh, in the school. So that when they the, the children start either daycare or school in the additional language or the community language, whatever language it is, that is different from the ones that they are um, exposed to at home, there, there can happen some kind of plateauing of the home language. That's to say they are exposed to the school language during, during the whole day and the week so the exposure is much higher much more intense mm -hmm. than the one in uh, now in this example there are two languages this is a green and the in the orange language but um what uh, jim cummins has pointed out since the 70s is that a child i just quote what is written there so i can read mm -hmm. <laughs> a child's second language competence is dependent in part on the level of competence the child has already attained in l1 mm -hmm. or l1 l2 l3 whatever uh, the how how many languages uh, the child is exposed to um, simultaneously or not, like in your case, from the beginning or let's say before attending school in the additional language. So uh, this is something that I find very important to, to emphasize on, that uh, the, what a child learned in one language can be transferred to the other one. So whether it is now, uh, in your case, Spanish at home then, uh, starting from year, when, when he was four, or, uh, or, or another language, it can be transferred. And I would like to share also other, other kind of um, 
another slide. So usually when our children start attending school, the school language somehow, yeah, there are some bumps on the road. It, it's not a straight line, it goes, but it goes upwards somehow. Yeah, you see the age around 20 ish. So it's it's even mm -hmm. beyond the teenage years. But what uh, what can happen, and this is uh, maybe the case that we can discuss a little bit uh, more, is when the home language is supported at school. Let's a let's say a little bit later, like you see with the orange um, line dotted line is the home language that is supported at school a little bit later than the school language. And uh, it's continuously supported. Let's just say that they get formal instruction. Then you can have some kind of this kind of development that goes like a parallel. Yeah. Okay. But what very often happens is this. So when the school language is supported at school, but the home language is not taught anywhere, or it's only us parents, or maybe some kind of weekend schools, it can uh, have a, a great development, but very often around, yes, 14, 15 years, it starts to plateau quite, uh, quite visibly. Mm -hmm. And it can become, I come back to the screen. Don't worry. <laughs> it can become more and more difficult during those uh, periods of time to really keep our, our children motivated and to, to also convince them, okay, we are learning now maybe to read in the home language, but, and I would like to share another slide. I, I promise it's not so many slides <laughs> that I have today, but just to illustrate it, and it's something that um, Sabine Little uh, has and is working on, and that is called this asynchronous literacy. And I find it very interesting. I think it's a, it's a very good example. For example, here on this screen, it's a talk that she held. Uh, example of what a nine-year-old child, this is German at home and English at school, is reading. Mm -hmm. So you see, you don't even have to read <laughs> the right. lines to see the difference of the text, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what she pointed out also is how how much this can affect somehow our children, right? I mean, if I imagine that my 15-year-old would, would need to read maybe a text that is for 10-year-olds, the content is not what they are finding appealing. Mm -hmm. uh, the syntax structure is way too, or way too easy. Uh, and so I personally would just give up or I just would not pick the book in, in German in this case or in, in Spanish or whatever the home language is. So what she um, points out also with her research, and here I would like to uh, send everyone to this uh, website that she has, that is uh, multilingualisminschools.net, uh, where she has a lot of material and she talks about something that I find very nice because it's, uh, it's called the river of reading. It's a way to um, help our children become more conscious about the books that they are reading and they are finding appealing or not appealing for whatever reason. But I, I will stop here. Maybe I will dedicate more time or, or space to this another time. But I found it very important to emphasize this, especially with our children. As you said, you, where you're living, uh, Spanish is not a community language. It's not a language that is supported from, from the first year in school. You, you mentioned uh, before we went on screen that uh, your son is having now Spanish lessons. Right? Yes. Um, here in public school, they do not teach Spanish. In eighth grade, this is his eighth grade. He's going on to high school. He's 13 years old. This is the first year, the actual first year that he has had a class that's fully in Spanish, you know. And um, in one sense, I was excited, you know, and happy that they're bringing Spanish into the school, but at the same time, a little sad that I wish it was earlier on, you know, and at least he's excelled in the Spanish class and and he's doing well, you know, but I was like, I want to go back a little bit what you were mentioning about the books, you know, the books that I usually present to him are more basic and more lower level, and they're not at the same level of his reading in his first language, which is the L1, the English. So that's where we have to create a balance, you know, looking for literature, you know, to get our children to read. At least, you know, I know right now he's doing well in Spanish class. Um, he has good grades. 
and I partly because of me, okay, and, you know, I'm just gonna have to pat myself on the back. <laughs> but you know, I I just wish you know, um, it wasn't the, it, it was a standard, and, and you know, and it it was from beginning of school year when he was in four four years old in pre kindergarten, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, you're not only mother of a teenager, but you are also a teacher. So oh, yes. your your experience as a Spanish teacher, mm -hmm. maybe you can share something about that. What? Uh, oh, definitely. With, with regards to motivation, right? Yes, definitely. Um, most of the t the students that I teach are elementary age. I'm talking about eight, nine, ten years old. But I also have my eleven and twelve. And I've had my teenagers, unfortunately, for some reason, um, with the teenagers, it seems to be harder to connect. And I think it's because the parents or relatives put a lot of pressure on them because normally their heritage, I mean, their family are Latino heritage. So they want their parents and the family want their children to know Spanish. And that's a little bit of pressure going on. And then at the same time, they tell me like, well, Francis, you know, he understands Spanish and, and he reads Spanish. I said, well, reading, you know, he can read words in Spanish, but not necessarily understand what he's reading. That's one. Two, he may understand. But when you put a pressure up, because I had a parent, she said, well, my mother, grandma, the child's grandma said, well, why isn't he speaking Spanish? I said, no. I said, you know, when, when and, and she told the grandchild, you know, why aren't you speaking Spanish? And, and what happened there? He's um, eight or nine. It raises or affect the filter. It puts pressure on them. And if they knew a little bit of, you know, Spanish or understood something that they would be able to show off, it just shuts down. It shuts down. And and mm -hmm. I tell parents, I said, don't, don't put, you know, don't put the pressure on them. And sometimes they stand um, or are in the class at the same time. And I could hear the parents say, well, you know what that means? And I'm like, oh, no. So I wait till the class finishes. And then I message the parents. I said, I know your intentions are well. And you feel that he does understand. But when you start chiming in and I'm trying to teach them a lesson, you know, they're hearing your voice on the other end and they're not able to understand or comprehend because they're putting that block right there. You know, the effective mm -hmm. filter goes up like so quickly, you know, and then the child will not respond. And then I will tell the child, okay, look at me, look at me. So we're going to go again. And we're, and then I repeat myself. Right. Yeah. Look at me. But then I can still hear the voices, you know, thankfully that has, um, um, I've been able to speak to some of my parents and that problem has been solved, you know, but at home, even when you're at home, and, and sometimes parents want to brag that their child is taking language lessons or they know Spanish or they're learning Spanish, then they want to show them off, you know, to their friends or family. Don't do that, especially not with teenagers, you know. Um, I have a confession to make. I did that with my teenager. When we went back to Puerto Rico, I said, well, baby, just talk to them in Spanish. And he just looked at me like I had lost my mind and I was crazy. <laughs> And during the whole trip, Putain, he did not speak not one word in Spanish. Yeah, I remember you shared that. <laughs> I was so disappointed. I'm like, no. But then I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson as a parent. Like, don't do that, you know. And 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 I try. And it's hard. It's hard because you know you want to you know brag and say, oh yes, you know. But no, especially with a teenager. No, no. You know, I guess. Yes. Parents have to understand that their expectations are high, but they're not realistic. Exactly. Yes, and and this is actually what uh, what I wanted to to focus on, right? So so when when parents send their children to to heritage or home language or minority language lessons or classes, mm -hmm. uh, they have very high expectations. They have a, a a goal in mind, right? Okay, I I, <laughs> I sent my child to to uh, Francis. <laughs> and he or she comes back and is fluent and can read and can sing and can write perfectly, mm -hmm. right? So not going to happen, right? No, no. no it's, it's, not. it's not something that happens very quickly, even even though with the slides that we shared, there, there are skills that are transferable. And especially when we are talking about uh, English and Spanish, somehow it is a bit easier than to, to start with English and then having Spanish because Spanish is more transparent language. But 
but still. And I would like to share one um, this, this uh, representation of the of the reading rope. I'm not going to go into details, but I find it interesting or, or helpful actually for parents who want their children to read in no time. And uh, especially when we tell them you can transfer these skills. So if your child is able to decode in one language, they can understand how de to decode in the other language. But in the end, what we can see in this nice reading rope uh, by uh, Holly Scarborough is that reading is quite complex. So <laughs> even though you know how it works, but for example, if you look at the at the upper strands, if you if you have the background knowledge of the language, the vocabulary knowledge, the language structure, the verbal reasoning, etc., the literacy knowledge uh, is is not there or is only rudimentary or is only, um, let's say, limited to the vocabulary in the world in at home, okay. then you cannot assume that the child will understand what he or she is reading. So, like you said before, Francis, they, they might be able to decipher and to really articulate nicely and very clearly what is written, but do they understand what they are reading? So this is a big question. And this is where I think many parents say, well, my child can enunciate everything very nicely. Why? Do, but are they actually able to formulate it with their own words, you know, with synonyms, with their words, the words that they are using constantly? And there you see then the gap that is happening. And that is this... Uh, this shock that many parents have then, right? Because um, with also this wave that we can see on the internet with parents who want their two-year-olds to be perfectly fluent in reading, um, it's it, reading is a very, very complex thing. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to, to highlight this. I wanted to chime in something real quick. You mentioned that, you know, on the internet, you see, you know, parents looking for two-year-olds to learn the uh, second language. And there are a lot of ads, a lot of, you know, I've seen it on the web that say, learn Spanish um, right away, learn Spanish from day one or learn whatever language from day one or whatever, you know, and that really sets up the parents, um, these high expectations and sets up the, the, the learner for failure, you know, because really you do not learn a language from day one. You could probably memorize some greetings, you know, but it doesn't mean that you've learned the language. And, and it is, it's hard, you know, as both of us, you know, as educators and, and teachers to tell or let the parents know, like, this is not, and like I told one of my parents, this is not going to be a couple of months or, mm. or a couple of weeks, you know, because I've had learners already like three or four, like two years or so. And I'm like, no, um, this is a lifelong process, you know. Mm -hmm. Look at my son. He's four years, he started when he's four years old. And I can say now that he's bilingual, but it took a while and it took a lot of consistency and, and a lot of um commitment on behalf of the parent. Thankfully, I know the second language and I'm able to teach it to them. Most of the parents know somewhat the second language, but are not fluent enough to teach their children. So mm -hmm. that's where I come in. You know, but it's it's a never-ending learning process. You know, and it takes Absolutely. years. Absolutely. And I would like to uh, quote Maria again. Thank you for following us, Maria, this uh, this evening, morning. I think you are also in the U.S. It's definitely harder to motivate tween and teens when it comes to language. Absolutely. Yes. Um, not only because of the teenage brain. We can we can talk about the teenage brain in a moment if you wish. But uh, also because of, of uh, everything else that's going on, um, they, they want to decide they want to, they have so many other activities and interests that are not uh, necessarily what parents suggest mm -hmm. them to do and to read and to, to explore. So um, that's also a, a step that we make as parents, right, in the, in the parenting kind of journey that we are on, that uh, we can actually guide them, yes, but in the end they are deciding. But there mm -hmm. are some ways also to... to um, somehow guide them in a, in a gentle way, right? So to give yeah. them, I, I always say, okay, I give you a choice, which book, this one or that one, it's not a question of no books. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but of course, um, also when we are talking about um, keeping the language interesting, language um, 
active and present in the everyday life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be necessarily with uh, regards to things that they do at school or only at home, etc. It can be everything. And we have so many different uh, sources and resources that we can uh, back us and them up with. So uh, a book, if someone doesn't like to, to read, they can listen to the books or someone has uh, difficulty in reading long books, then there are always solutions. So I'm thinking of all those who who do not like to read that much. So mm -hmm. it's it's not that the world will close for them. It's absolutely not there. If they're interested in, in learning more, they will. Um, but uh, yes, shall we, shall we maybe talk about the next uh, step or <laughs> what we wanted to talk about the the teenage brain shall we do that yes sure mm -hmm. or or would you like to have we can also try to to talk about what kind of resources or how we can define the resources and okay well um, let's talk a little bit about the 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 teenage brain you know um, before um, we agreed on, on the topic and whatnot, I was actually looking because I think when I approached you, the first thing I said, Ute, let's talk about the bilingual teenage brain. And then you kind of chuckled and laughed, you know, like, oh, wow, that is, <laughs> that is so, that is such a big, huge open book, you know. And mm -hmm. um, truth is, there aren't many resources no. um, out there about the teenage brain. Um, mm -hmm. And how do we work around that? You know, um, psych psychologist Piaget, um, he proposes that the intelligence develops, you know, and grows throughout a series of stages, you know. So the brain is continuously learning and growing. And, you know, and one of the points in his theory is that the intelligence is and the knowledge is actively inherent and constantly learning. So there is the possibility for our teenagers to continue learning but at the same time we have all these other emotional factors that play in and and it's just that they just can't help themselves like they forget they can't remember a um, mood swings you know and then as parents we, we need to balance that out you know for instance one day my child is like comes in the room like, mommy, um, I want you to teach me more Spanish and focusing more on grammar, verb conjugation. I say, sure, yay. And I'm like, yes, we're going to do this. Then two days later, I say, okay, I have this for you, but I don't want to do that. I'm like, okay, you know, mm -hmm. so, and I know he has the ability to learn it. I think it's the whole emotional aspect and, and the brain that's developing and he wants to, this is when they start making major decisions, you know, in their world, you know, about what is about them, you know, like for instance, you know, Spanish, she came in saying, I want to learn some more Spanish. Can you help me? You know? And then um, he's one day he comes like that. The next day he's like, no, I don't want to. So I just take a step back and just let it be. And then I, approach again and come back again i said okay remember when you told me about this he said oh yeah yeah you know i said well let's do this you know what do you think and then right now he's going on vacation you know summer vacation no more school he finished today with his last day and i proposed to him i said let's do 25 minutes that's all i'm asking from 24 hours a day 25 minutes that's all i'm asking so we can sit down and do some spanish and i was going to focus on reading literacy you know and get him to read and so read because he does read he does understand but i know some verb conjugations some things that he doesn't understand and how will he build his vocabulary if he doesn't read so i'm going to focus on reading you know and i all i ask him because i think 25 minutes is not too long for them you know he, you know if i say an hour every day oh my god like the end of the world like how can i do an hour i have things to do okay, you're 13 years old and you're home on vacation. So can you tell me what other things you can do? This is me in my mind thinking, you know, but I'm not. I said, okay, so let's just do 25 minutes, you know, yeah. because, because it's more attainable, you know, and we're going to sit down and talk and we're going to read, you know, and not even a whole book, you know, a couple of pages, you know, 
And then we're going to discuss grammar, you know, ask mm -hmm. him, you know, to identify cognate words if he can understand the language, if he doesn't, you know, or the words. And that's, at least that's my plan right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know how it goes because, yes, um, as, as we were saying, yes, the teenage brain is very, very uh, specific. And I mean, they're, they're highly interesting. And, and it's not that they become mm, somehow more absent. It's it's the, the, the opposite. Actually, it's okay. like uh, fireworks happening in their brain and their body. Everything is in movement and, and rapidly, rapidly changing. And they are, in fact, also uh, very rapid in learning compared to maybe four or five-year-olds, right? Where you have to repeat and repeat and repeat several mm -hmm. times until at some point, oh, look, they are using the word that you were actually repeating billion times. Oh. No. So the the way to assimilate and to learn and to actually um, transform a word from a receptive kind of vocabulary that sits in your mind to become active mm -hmm. goes much quicker. Yes. But this also means that uh, they are exposed to so many triggers, different triggers that they want to try out. And this one, the next one, the next one. And I say, uh, at some point, a, a psychologist friend of mine, she said, it's it's like uh, another, you know, the terrible three or two, depending oh, on who yeah. you are. Uh, it's, it's like a second phase, but in on another level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, finding something that is actually, let me come to, uh, to you on the screen. Um, Something that is motivating them a lot is when it is rewarding, when it's highly rewarding. You know, this kind of uh, necessity or, or this, this feeling of I need an instant reward. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's almost there when, when the children are, or children, when the teenagers are teenagers mm -hmm. during the teenage years. So, um, and I'm not getting into the details because I think we can okay. make another session about the teenage yeah. brain in detail, but I would like to um, share again another slide. <laughs> this is one uh, site that I highly recommend. It's a, it's a very short video, actually, and you can access this okay. through the, the QR code. And it's from uh, UNICEF. It's about the adolescent brain. And how you can see, there is a second window of opportunity. You know that very often people say there is only one window of opportunity and that closes. No, there are many of those. And there is one actually between uh, when the children are between 9 and 14 years old. And this is where uh, they have, it's a period of really rapid growth. You just have to look at the picture of your, your son, maybe when he was nine, and then yeah. he's 13. It's, it's another person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the whole features uh, change, and not only on the outside, but also on the inside. And we know this. I mean, we've been through this. But if you see uh, here on the slide, if you, if you look, uh, these are just uh, some screenshots of the video. Uh, there are things that they find challenging and are really hard, and it really seems like there are huge hurdles to take. And then there are other things that are opportunities for them that they really find enticing, that they 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 all almost obsessively want to mm -hmm. pursue, like a, a new sport, a new uh, anything, a new activity, or mm -hmm. reading a book could also be one, or, or watching movies, or then the gaming, right? But let's. Yeah. <laughs> take aside the gaming we don't get there another one that i would wanted to share here just very quick quickly is use it or lose it the adolescent brain it's also a very uh, educative um uh video about this uh about the lose it use it or lose it um and that comes back to to what is said also when when children learn languages and then um, many parents think oh if i don't teach my child uh the languages whatever languages they are before they are six or seven or some even say three but that's quite wider uh then they won't learn anymore but fact is that um the teenage brain, I mean, we are at school after six years. Yeah, that's actually the period where the most learning happens. Mm -hmm. And we learn all our life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it would be strange to say we can only learn during the first 10 ish years of our lives. What do we do with the rest of our life? We just uh, live from that? No. Actually, what, what happens in the brain is that the, the, the pathways are consolidated. It's called myelination. But, anyways, 
uh, even if the children are exposed to several languages and they learn how to read and to write, etc., if there is not a repetition in this, then they, they might not lose it, but actually it, it goes a little bit more in the background. And this is, this is why I insist so much on uh, planting the seeds whenever yeah. you are ready and whenever the child is ready. And then um, water them, give a little bit of sun and, and uh, let the, the, the plant grow, mm -hmm. whatever this is. So this is just a little bit uh, a parenthesis about the, the the brain that I find very, very interesting and very, very important when we talk about teenagers. So it's not that they are not motivated. I think they are motivated if we take them with the right topics. Exactly. To talk about and to, to uh, let them dive into what they are mm -hmm. interested in and not what we think they should be learning or knowing at this point, so. Yeah, and, and I think right now, you know, as parents and even as educators, you know, what we can do to help them is provide a supportive um, learning environment, um, not that they see it as something that's been imposed, mm -hmm. rather that we're just helping you, because mm -hmm. um, that teenage brain can rebel and say, no, I don't want to do this anymore, you know, and whatnot. And also revisit, you know, not only your, I mean, your child's learning style, not everyone, when when we were talking, you were talking, to, it just came to my mind, maybe your child doesn't like to read. What about maybe introduce them to audiobooks in mm -hmm. the minority language, you know? Because there's some children that they just cannot sit down and read. So let's just introduce them, you know, to the audiobook. And I, for instance, I've tried audiobooks, Ute, but it doesn't work because my brain can't, you know, I can't retain it because I'm listening. Then at a certain part, I, I get lost. I say, okay, so that is not for me, you know. Mm -hmm. but it could be for a teenager who doesn't like to read, you know. So I guess it's just looking, you know, finding different approaches. You know, I would mm -hmm. try first a book, so something that they're interested in. Um, Audio books, it just came to my mind while we were uh, discussing this, you know, and provide a supportive environment, not not pressure them, you know, as much as we want to say, no, you need to learn and you need to respond in, in the minority language or Spanish language or whatever. No, you know, just yeah. let it be, you know. Yes, absolutely, yes. And I'm I'm so with you with the audiobooks. I have uh, my three children have three different ways to to like reading. They all like reading, but one of my uh, my daughters doesn't like to sit down with a, that kind of book. Mm -hmm. So she prefers uh, shorter stories. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. But what she did, <laughs> she loves audiobooks. So the Lord of the Ring, she was eight years old. She, she was listening to the Lord of the Ring. We, we, we went on a long trip and she was listening to it. She listened to it the whole time. And she could quote passages from the Lord of the Ring. And I was like, where do you have it from? And really, you could go on the book and it was Find the it. right passage. So she had a way to memorize through listening much higher than reading. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas I need to read and listen. So <laughs> I'm a combination of my children all together. But um, and my other children, they, they can learn the most if they if they read and then they write it down for example for exams etc so i find it very interesting and i find it important also that we can um let our children discover what works best for them mm -hmm. it's of course when we are talking about teenagers they don't uh they they read to learn they mm -hmm. don't learn to read anymore unless yeah they learn to read in an additional language yeah so when they they have maybe i don't know here uh here in, in my children at school they had spanish and french then when they were 11 12 years old so that was whilst they were <laughs> reading to learn in the school language they were learning to read in the additional languages and there there is some kind of a mismatch in my opinion yeah. because they they you know you are with your brain already somewhere else the pace of reading is much faster in the school language and then you you want to <laughs> you are required to pace down and this is in my opinion personal opinion i know <laughs> uh, not uh, a very positive development for for the teenage brain in that sense and this is what uh, i think this discouraged and doesn't encourage very much uh, mm -hmm. young young people teenagers or preteens to start a new language because you, 
you open the textbook, it's these sentences like in baby books. You are not a baby. You you don't feel like a baby. Exactly. So that is not what you need. You need to to go into I don't know <laughs> a shop and ask for a product. You you need to be able to say hello to a peer when you go to that country or when you happen to to use the language. So I think well, but I'm I'm opening a can of worms here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not very easy. But um, I know that we we can talk about this uh, even more in detail. But what can we say about the teen? Well, the teenage brain. I shared some of the of of these things. What I wanted to share also, like we were talking now about um, how to choose the. Um, the different resources. There are also ways to choose that book for our teenager who is at a certain level, right? Instead of us moms or, or parents say, okay, take this book that your peers are reading in the country where this language is spoken and that might be too complicated and too hard for our children because they the pace is slower. So there is one, one thing I'm sharing again, <laughs> that is called the closed test that one can do. Well, the closed test is these, these texts where there, there are words missing and then you have to find in a, in a list of words mm -hmm. which word is matching the context. Mm -hmm. This is one way to do this. But then there is a reverse closed test. And this is actually something that I told my, uh, my teenage uh, students and also yeah, the children of the families that I help with. And when they want to choose a book, let them go to the library or to the bookstore mm -hmm. and then open randomly a page of the book that they find interesting. And then try to read one page. And if in this page you understand most of what is happening, if there is like 20% of words that you don't really grasp immediately or that you could, uh, then it's fine. If it's more than that, a part of the style of the writer, etc., that comes also into into um, it's, it's also very important. But if it's more than these twenty-ish percent, then it might be too difficult. That's to say that the child might or the teenager might take the book, read two three pages, and then put it aside. So it's mm -hmm. it's easier for them to find a book when they can understand most of the context. I don't mean by that that they need to understand every word on the page because many words we can understand thanks to the context. Yeah, yes. we understand what is in there. But there, there is another thing that we uh, talked about, right, uh, Francis? So oh, I, yes. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something about the translation of the book? Yeah. Um, most of the time, as parents, we always want to look for authentic literature, you know, in, in our home language. But most of the time we, we don't find it. And, and if we do, it is too advanced for our teenagers, you know. Now we have translations of books, you know, if it's something that, uh, I'm just trying to remember a book right now when my child, um, he devoured when he was younger. Um, I think it was The Diary of a Wimpy Kid. <laughs> Yeah. It's English, okay. So he he read the whole series, all the books, and I said, okay, I'm gonna bring in Spanish, and he actually enjoyed the Spanish one because he already knew um, what was going on, you know, what he had already read. So he was reading it in Spanish now, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes we have to compromise. I know there are a lot of people like no, it has to be authentic, you know, literature from the language that they're learning. But most of the time, you know, that tends to be a little bit more difficult, you know, and we need to balance. Again, the key word is balancing. So obviously, you know, Diary of a Wimpy Kid is not an authentic Spanish literature, but it's in yeah. English. He loves it and he's reading it in Spanish, you know, so yes. that's wonderful. You know, for me, yeah. that's a win-win. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It, it pretty much depends also on what kind of readers they are. Mm -hmm. uh, if they are readers who, who want to read a book once and then it's enough, or if they, they like also to read uh, the same book twice or three times, four yes. times or something like that. And, and if they enjoy also the reading then in the, in the other language, or if, if it's a bit uh, confusing, for example, my children try to learn to read the um, Harry Potter in, in different languages. And then they said, 
but the names are all mixed up. They had other <laughs> names and they got fed up with, oh no, I don't like that. So it's fine. Mm -hmm. So the book can be something else. And there are not only books, right? So there are magazines, there That's are uh, all kind of things that, uh, that they can get more information and get more familiar with the language with our podcasts as well and, and songs we don't have to forget the songs oh, yes. that's, a, that's another one right mm -hmm. so that, there are so many different ways that we can help our children to enjoy uh, the language or the languages that we have at home mm -hmm. and um, maybe we can share also some some other resources that uh Right, that'll work. <laughs> and activities that can help. Uh, let me share the slide of this book by a lady that is on the screen. Yours. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it is a book that's completely in Spanish, and of course, it's geared for children age. I mean, I'm not sure grades three to five. That's seven to nine, ten year old. Mm -hmm. But older kids can also read it. So what I had was a teacher um, use this for her middle schoolers. Um, mm -hmm. She used it for her middle schoolers, and they actually enjoyed it. So that was a, a big one for me, too. So with Coco, um, the children will learn about the conservation efforts, you know, of the endangered species of the Puerto Rican parrot in Puerto Rico and, you know, how to preserve them, you know. Mm -hmm. But not only that, they will also learn that i'm not sure you have it on the next slide or not okay that no. coco no that's okay coco is a very 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 um special parrot and i don't want to give it away because you guys have to read it but exactly. it does it does highlight bilingualism you know that bilingualism is a superpower even if you have a dialect and even if you have an accent so i would just leave it right there <laughs> Yes, and uh, here is more more information, and again also a, a QR code where to get it, and uh, more information about it that I find very very important also to highlight, like you just did, uh, mm -hmm. that it's not only a, a story about uh, a bird. A bird, exactly. <laughs> but you can also you can also discover the cultural background, where he comes from, yes. the, the the nature and um, and everything that comes with it. So yes. it's it's mm -hmm. something that you can read maybe when you start when you are eight, seven, eight, and then you read it again later and you you discover other other details then. Yeah. Exactly. I want to share something real quick. That little character, the little boy in, in the cover, mm -hmm. that's actually my son. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have, you know, yeah. obviously I would have loved to have her in this book when he was seven or eight years old, but I wrote it now when he's 13 and um, he did enjoy it and children, um, seven, eight, nine, ten year old do enjoy it and middle schoolers too. So I think okay. it's, it's good because it's already been tested out in middle school, um, mm -hmm. actually in Puerto Rico too, um, five different groups and they all love the story. So um, okay. I think that's a win. Mm -hmm. That's a win, absolutely. Yes. Then there is uh, there are others. That's uh, one is the book that I co-authored with Anna Elisa Miranda. That's the toolbox for multilingual families. This is where we have just activities that one can do. Um, some involve also reading and writing. So depending on on the fluency of the children and yes, teenagers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other book is by Yoshito Darmon Shimamori. That's a parent's guide to raising multiliterate children. Again, there are a lot of activities to do to foster reading and writing in yeah. children. And he has uh, plenty of ideas and uh, it's really something that I recommend. He also is now uh, writing a, a graphic novel for preteens that is, uh, is still in the making, but he allowed me to share the title. It's In Search of the Lost Words, a bilingual time travel adventure. It's a typical time to travel adventure for eight to 12 year old children. And I will leave the, the, um, the link in, in the comment section. Mm -hmm. So those are some resources that, that can be helpful and uh, that can help also to bridge 
um, between, let's say, more the, the classroom kind of setting that sometimes we have also at home when we are the parents who are transmitting our language and teaching also our children to read and write, if this is not done at school and if there are no weekend schools or not uh, something that suits our agenda and our children, then we do it at home. And in order to make it in a fun and entertaining way, there are ways to, to do it, right? So exactly. that's something that I wanted to share. Um, <laughs> Maria says, I, I have to quote her. <laughs> Thank you, Maria, again. Oh, okay, you didn't know the image was based on your son. No, yes, it was yeah. a movie <laughs> thing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, is something that I, I just wanted to share. So it's not only books. It's not only uh, something that needs to be classroom or class situation related, but it can be anything, right? Yes, mm -hmm. I agree. I just shared the the website from uh, Yoshito, okay. the library for multilinguals, where you can find a lot of material as well. So, Francis, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we shared some resources. We have done th some things. What would be maybe three or four or five, how many we want, we can decide how many we want to share. Uh, some tips for parents uh, whose teenagers just really don't want to read, don't want to talk or are not that interested in the, in the home language, especially when they are teens, right? Um, first of all, I think the, the most important one is not to pressure you know, or yeah, pressure or obligate the child or the teenager to speak, you know, that that is going to backfire in ways that you have no idea, you know. And I think as parents, we just need to have a lot of patience during this time. Because let me tell you, Tay, there's some days I'm like, I just want to like, are you kidding me? But then I'm like, okay. Teenage brain, teenage brain, teen. I keep repeating it to myself. And then the other thing, we need to remember that we were teenagers too, but we don't remember what we did, you know? Because I, unfortunately, I remember very well. <laughs> or fortunately, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. No, I remember, uh, well, I remember what my mom tells me, but, you know, for me, it's like a blur, you know, but I think that the first one is just being very patient, you know, and, and present them. The teenagers want to make their own decision, yeah. not have the decision made for them. So, you know, that like, oh, right. look, an audiobook or look, this book. And they're going to look at you like, no, you know, just give them options and let them decide. I think it's so important because this is when they're starting to, to recognize, you know, their own independence and they can make their own decisions, you know, and we have to be patient, you know. And there is that, like you mentioned, the second window of opportunity that it's there, but this time rather than us guiding them and leading them to it, they have to do it themselves, you know. Okay. And that's when we just have to just, just be very patient, you know. Yes, and I think it's um, it's exactly what uh, what I would would say. Not only the patience, but also to take a step back. I mean, we have um, planted the seeds before, so it's mm -hmm. not that they start when they are teenagers with this language. But even if they start when they are teenagers with that language, uh, they have their own pace. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I say, well, try to lean back and think about when they are 30. Yeah, I, to parents of, of very young children, I said, think about them when they are 18. But then when they're teenagers, I think about them when they are 30. And think about what they might be needing when they work, where they work at the workplace, or when they study, or with their colleagues. Sure. They will be able to, to uh, improve much quicker because you have planted the language and the seeds mm -hmm. before. So this is something that they have in their backpack. I always think about Dora in this time. <laughs> yes. In the backpack, you just have to, to, to find the right tool, Aka, the language, or mm -hmm. however it is you, you need to express yourself. So Yeah. And, and along that same line, remember that I mentioned to you that um, when I when I was excited that he was taking Spanish class in school, and when I would ask him, he said, no, 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 you know, he, I don't remember, I don't know, you know, 
Yeah, it was fine. But when the teacher told me that he was actively helping him and he was speaking in Spanish and he was helping his peers, I'm like, oh my goodness, yes, you know. But of course, I didn't tell my child anything because, you know, then, you know, he's like, you're messing even my teacher, you know, this whole teenage brain, you know. So, but I know it's there. I just, you know, we just have to allow it to let it be, you know. Exactly, yes. And and I mean, these are little successes that we can share with ourselves. We can give them a high five or like a, like a blink with the eye. But oh, in, yeah. inside, we just jump and we say, yes. <laughs> no, I just wanted to hug him. I'm like, no. Like, no because, you know, hugs are not allowed either, you know. Like, oh, why are you hugging me? No, it's it's like, no. No, no, but uh, it is it is a, a success story and, and something that that they will also cherish and that they are cherishing. But mm-hmm. yes, it's better not to lose our cool. We I know. Oh, <laughs> you're good in Spanish. Good. Uh-huh. <laughs> when they are out of the, exactly. the room, we can share. We can share it here. Now he knows it. If he watches this, it's gone. It's, yeah, it's exactly. over. <laughs> But he'll probably not be interested in watching his mom, you know, talk, you know, need to make no. But who knows? Maybe some couple of years down the road, like, Mama, you were talking about me. <laughs> yeah, and, and he will say, maybe Leonidas in a few years, when you watch this, you might say, Mommy, you made a fool of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, what exactly. sometimes I hear. But that's fine. I'm I'm happy with that. So I I see that we don't have any any further comments. I think mm-hmm. um, yes, there are some a Facebook users said lovely and yes and good mm-hmm. afternoon wherever we are. <laughs> Thank you very much for everyone who who could follow us. I know that some are on holidays by side of the world. That's uh, mm-hmm. at least. Uh, I would like to thank you, gracias, uh, Francis. De nada. <laughs> uh, merci, gracias so much for taking the time uh, to talk about our teenagers, to talk about how to keep this language, the, the language is somehow alive, also when uh, the community is not so supportive. And uh, I'm planning to have other sessions about uh, teenagers <laughs> in the future. And I'm very happy that we could take uh, this first step together. Yes. So thank yeah. you. I'm I'm super happy to be here with you. Thank you so much for jumping on on board this crazy idea. Because when I messaged you, all I said is teenage bilingual language learning brain. And then you said, yes, let's do something. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. I I love doing this. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, thank you also for all those who will be maybe watching this uh, as a recording, please. Keep on talking about this, keep on asking questions or, or also sharing your experience, your own experience with your children or the, the ones that you are teaching, yeah. if you are a teacher and uh, nothing. Let's continue the conversation and I hope to see you back, Francis. At some yes, point. I would love <laughs> to be back. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Maybe after summer, you know, uh, I'll, I'll let you know how successful I was with with this twenty five minute reading um, session. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We want to know now. This is uh, this exactly. We will. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.